Hi guys, and this evening I want to look at CSS, why working with CSS can be really difficult, and then looking at the use of SAS, which is an extension to CSS which allows you to do a number of cool things, and then looking at how to actually build a SAS function into your web application so that you can automate as much of it as possible. So we've got kind of a number of steps tonight, but let's start by looking at an example website here. And if we bring up the CSS file for this site, you'll see that it's really, 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 really big. And this is not the most complicated site that you will ever see, but yet we've still got a CSS file that's got a good few thousand lines in it. And maintaining that is really difficult. Firstly, because it's really hard to find stuff. Even if you know that you want to change a button, what do you actually look for? I mean, even... If you inspect the element, you can kind of see where certain things come from and you might think, oh, that's great. I'll just kind of turn off the, the orange or whatever. But then you see, oh, we've got an orange border. So where does the orange border come from? That comes from the same place, etc., etc. So finding things and working out what's going on can be really difficult, especially if you didn't write any of this and you were just trying to maintain it. It's also really hard when you're changing things to work out what's going to happen if you change it. So it's all very well going and saying, I'm going to change the color of the font. But actually, in this example, if I change the color of this font, it's going to change the color of this font as well, even if I didn't intend for that to happen. Now, in this example, you would see that very obviously because these are both on the same page. But what about if this is on a different page somewhere else? I'm going to have to go through every single page of my site just to make sure that making a change hasn't broken something that I didn't intend it to break. And that can be a real pain in CSS. Another problem with these is if you see when I showed you earlier on disabling the orange button, you'll see that there was a border that was a slightly different color of orange. And that's quite common to make a border slightly darker. Or if you see here, when you hover, the button goes slightly darker as well. And using normal CSS, you'd have to calculate most of that yourself. You'd have to put in the orange color and work out what happens if you divide all of it by, you know, or remove 10% of its brightness or something like that. Compute that number and put it into your CSS as a number that the browser will understand. And obviously doing all those things manually is very time consuming and kind of a bit annoying. And you have the same problem where if you want to change something, you might try and find and replace a color. But what you're not going to then find is all of the places where you might have darkened it or lightened it. And what you end up with is numbers that are very similar, but maybe slightly different. And they can be quite hard to, to dig them all out. Changing a base color of anything in CSS can be very brittle. So I've already mentioned this, but if you change the color of a button, is it going to change the color of the other buttons? What if that color is defined as a kind of a, a root color for the whole page? Well, if I want to make the title bar red, can I do that without making the buttons red? And again, the big problem is, am I going to know if I've broken something without going through the entire site and trying to find that out or indeed building your CSS again from scratch? Another problem with modern web applications that are very large is CSS can be really hard to work on in a team because it's basically one big text file. The only way you'd be able to let somebody, say, work on navigation at the same time that somebody else was working on, say, a carousel would be to have lots of separate CSS files. But if you have separate CSS files, either you've got to copy them all into one big file at some point, so you're actually working in, in a different way to each developer, or you need to have a page that pulls in maybe 10 different CSS files, and that's obviously not efficient in terms of HTTP requests and stuff. So you can work around those problems, but really CSS by itself has kind of grown out of being useful and is now starting to show its age. So along have come really two main alternatives. There are more than two, but the two most famous are called SAS, which is there, and LESS, which I believe is called lesscss.org. So these two pretty much do the same job in a slightly different way. Originally, LESS was a JavaScript for functionality which you would use uh, Node and Node Package Manager to get. And originally, SAS was available only as a Ruby plugin. 
So SAS was great if you're using Ruby, LESS was great if you're using JavaScript. Nowadays, they're both available on JavaScript. And for reasons that I'm not completely sure about, SAS seems to be quite a lot more popular than LESS. So Bootstrap used to use LESS and now Bootstrap use SAS. It doesn't really matter to me. It doesn't really matter to the video because actually doing both of these is very similar. But we're going to choose SAS, the language, and I'm going to show you how we build that on Windows. So let's go to the code for this website here. So this is running on my local host. And this is the site here in NetBeans. The first thing to realize about my example, and this is something that you'll need to think about for your web applications, the E2 advanced template has the idea of a backend and admin site and a front end. Now, in this case, I've left the back end running Bootstrap. That's what it uses by default. And to be honest, I don't really care too much what the admin site looks like. It's easier just to leave it as it is. Obviously, the front end is the one that I want to make look nicer. I want to use the branded colors and, and everything else. So I've got to choose where I want to actually put my SAS folder, where I'm going to start running all these scripts and building up my CSS. Now, if you were using a uh, if you're writing a Node.js web application, then you would probably have the files that I'm about to create in the root of the web application because the same file that builds the SAS would also run the server and do other stuff as well. But in my case, this is a PHP website, so I don't need all of that um, cluttering up the root. I've already got enough junk in there as it is. So because I'm only using the front end for uh, the SAS work and because I don't want the thing in the base, I'm just going to create a folder in here and I'm going to call it scripts. And obviously you can call it whatever you like, doesn't really matter. And at the minute, there's nothing in there because it's just a folder. Now, in order to do most of these things for less and for SAS, I'm going to need to install a few things. Now, obviously, I've already installed them because I've already run through this. But let's just go through them anyway. I'm going to use git bash because pretty cool and it allows us to do uh, all the git stuff and everything like that. So the first thing you're going to need to do is install Node.js. Now, if you're running on Windows, the good news is it's very easy. You download a Windows installer, you run it, you accept all the defaults and it just installs. So that's fantastic. Then we need to install a couple of global modules. So uh, Node Package Manager comes with Node.js and it's very commonly used for lots of different stuff. So there's loads and loads of Node modules for just about everything in the world. Just a nice, easy way of, uh, of getting what we need to do for this. And we're going to use Gulp, which is a scripting tool. So you might have heard of Grunt. You might have heard of Gulp. Again, they kind of do the same job in slightly different ways. Gulp tends to be more popular nowadays than Grunt. But if you already use Grunt, just use Grunt. Uh, you'll obviously have to change these instructions accordingly. The nice thing about Gulp is it has this concept of just piping stuff. So you just pipe stuff between lots of different tasks and then it just kind of magically works. In this case, I'm going to install Gulp globally. So the little dash G just means it's a global installation. Obviously, I've already installed that. So hopefully, even though it's going to pretend to install it again, all it's actually going to do is check that all the packages are up to date and all the rest of it, and hopefully it will tell me it's updated it, even though it won't have actually updated it. And then the second one that I'm going to install is called Gulp CLI, Gulp-CLI for the command line interface, and that just allows me to run it here in the command line. Again, I'm going to install that globally, which is cool hopefully, and again, it's going to do the same thing. It'll have a think about it and do all of that. So when we use anything with Gulp and with Node, we kind of need a, a certain couple of basic files in place. If you notice here, I'm already in the scripts folder, the one I created, so I'm all, all, already in the correct place. So the first thing that I want to do is I'm going to call npm init. And what this is going to do is it's going to create me a package.json file, which is kind of just going to say this is a, 
a node project, even though I'm not actually going to use node in a normal sense. So I need a, a JSON file in there so I can bring in my dependencies and any other modules that I need to use. So it's now going to ask me for certain things to fill in. So I can just call this uh, Electronic Club SAS version 1.0. You don't have to fill most of these in, but um, and some of them, like the name, you can't use capital letters. SAS generator for EC site. Uh, entry point, just leave that because when there's no actual entry point. Uh, test command, not bothered about that. Git repository, not bothered about that. Keywords, not bothered. Author, might as well put me in there. License, MIT, is this OK? And so if we look back here in NetBeans, you can see the package.json has been created and unsurprisingly, it contains everything that I've just typed in. So that's pretty cool. Now, until I've done the package.json, I'm not going to be able to install any node modules. So now that I've done that, I'm now going to install something locally. I'm going to do npm install and this time I'm going to install gulp. Now, I'm not going to do dash G because this is not the global one. This is saying I want gulp in my project here. And like most applications, like most package managers, we'll end up with a, a modules folder, a bit like Composer adds vendor. We will have a node modules folder, which we can git ignore because we don't want that in source control. But we still need to do this so that package JSON has gulp added as a dependency. Now, specifically here, the thing about using gulp in this sense to build sas into css is we're not going to use this in production so we don't want to have it as a normal dependency we just want to have it as a dev dependency and that means in production if we run these things up again and, and then do kind of uh, npm install with a i can't remember what it is dash dash no dev i think then it won't install gulp because we won't need it in production so we mark that by doing dash dash save dev Again, this is going to go away and um, go on its kind of merry way. Now, while that's doing that, let's pop back to NetBeans. Now, NetBeans has a built-in kind of source control viewer. So I'm just going to bring up the repository browser. And at some point, it's going to pick up all of these node modules so these again these are things that download off the internet i don't really want copies of them in source control because it's just not necessary it's going to fill up source control and they update all the time anyway so one of the first things i'm now going to need to do is add a git ignore dot git ignore so if i do that uh not quite sure I'll probably do that can i dot git ignore and in my dot git ignore i'm going to say ignore the node modules folder save now if i refresh this list that's finished and once it's kind of got itself back there again it's going to say right okay you've added a package json so we added that the package lock is a recording of which versions of each of the dependencies have been installed so that will be added to source control the git ignores there and in this case i've modified main and these two just for the purposes of the tutorial but you don't need to worry about that but basically now we've got a, a slightly cleaner view of what's going on so that's pretty cool we've now got to decide what we're going to do with with our sas files so the nice thing about most sas files is they come really as a, a hierarchy of different um, categories if you like so you might have your grids in one file you might have your form controls in another file and so I'm just going to create a folder under here makes sense obviously to try and keep things in a reasonably sensible place and I've actually downloaded already the library that I'm going to use which is the ink um, ink framework and it's pretty cool there are a couple of nasties with the sas stuff which i'll show you as we go through uh, the ink framework sas is designed to run with grunt file and compass and a, a, another load of things which means it doesn't quite work out of the box but um, i can fix that so i'm going to go into here on my other screen which you can't see and in that sas folder i'm just going to paste a load of files so you'll see them appear under here so I've downloaded these from a framework. Now this 
basically works for any framework that uses SAS or less if you're using less. The same basic idea exists is that you have a SAS folder in the framework. They also have JavaScript and everything else. But for what I'm doing here, I'm not interested in a JavaScript. I'm only interested in SAS. Now, one of the things just to note to begin with is that the extension is actually SCSS, not SASS. SASS was an older format. It's not really used anymore. So it's slightly confusing. But when we're talking about SAS, most of the time we're talking about SCSS files. So that's the first thing. The second thing is you'll notice that a lot of them have an underscore at the start and an underscore just tells the compiler you don't need to directly compile this file because it will be included somewhere else. So anything that has an underscore doesn't get built directly. I'm sure you can probably force it if you wanted to, but that would be a bit weird. Why would you do that? And the other thing that's really important to note here is like a lot of frameworks, Inc. Have, have offered a number of different kind of base files depending on what you want to build. So they have a legacy version which supports much older browsers. They have a flex version which uses Flexbox. So that only supports new-ish browsers. And then they have the IE1, whatever that is. And then they have just a basic full on ink one as well. And if we look inside one of these, you'll notice that it's basically just a load of imports. So import various things, theme things, module things. So like I say, it's all separated out nicely into separate stuff. And all of these will basically be importing get compiled into one massive big file at the end of the day so that's pretty straightforward we'll look at customizing it later obviously our git list has now got really big because we've got all of that sass in there but but that's right we kind of want that because like i found out the other day when my hard disk died because i didn't have all of this inside my project I had built it outside of the project, so I'd lost everything, even though I managed to recover this code, uh, sorry, the code for the web application. I didn't have any of the SAS, which I used to build the CSS that you can see here now. So I'm now going through the process of doing this so I can try and get my colors back and everything else. Fortunately, I hadn't modified it too much from the original, just the colors. So I don't think it will be too difficult. Okay. So we've now got some SAS stuff ready to go and we've got a package.json which we're not massively interested in. Now the first thing that we're going to need to do if we want to use Gulp, so remember Gulp is our kind of command line JavaScript scripting tool. So in the scripts folder I'm going to add another empty file. I'm going to add gruntfile.js, sorry grunt file, got grunt on the, on the mind, gulpfile.js. And gulp file is just a kind of a, a marker that says this is a, this is where you would expect to find gulp in a JavaScript file called gulp file. Uh, I'm sure you can kind of specify it using something else, but by default, when you run gulp, it will look for something called gulp file. And the first thing that we need to do, unsurprisingly, is bring in a variable so that we can access gulp functionality. So remember, at the minute, this is just pure JavaScript. But because this is going to run in this node project that we created with our package.json, when I call this, the node command line is going to know what that means. It's going to know that it can find gulp under node modules and it will find it under there and it will load it this way. And then gulp uses all of these other things um, depending on what it's doing, obviously. So that's the first thing. And... Obviously, now we need to get Gulp to actually do something. So the first thing that's really important that we try is just something really, really simple. I can't stress this enough. I say in all of my videos, always build these things up one thing at a time, because if you do 50 things and it doesn't work, then you can take you a long time to go all the way back again to find out where it is that you went wrong. So before we do anything with the SAS, let's just make sure that we can get Gulp to work properly. Um, and hint it's not going to so let's just go into here and if I run gulp and then the task name was called hello I think I'm gonna get an error oh no I'm not it's gonna work 
because I've already installed Grunt CLI, uh, sorry, Gulp CLI. So if you can see there, that's actually the important bit. The rest of it's just metadata. Hello world, you know, nice and easy. It's working. When I first ran this, I didn't have Gulp CLI installed. Remember, we installed that globally at the beginning. And so therefore I got Gulp command not found and I was kind of scratching my head a bit. So obviously I wasn't reading my instructions very well. So that's there, that works. So that's step one done. We've got Gulp, it's been installed using No Packet Manager and it does something really simple. So the next thing we want to start um, looking at is using SAS, the SAS compiler that comes as a node, um, node module. And that is actually called, not massively surprising, Gulp SAS. So it's not just a SAS library, it's a SAS library designed to work in a Gulp task. So really it's quite a thin wrapper around libsas. And so libsas, actually I better make sure that's installed because I can't remember whether I had to install it before or not. Uh, no, it's not installed, so let's add that. Yeah, the uh, SAS functionality is just really a library that lots of different Lot different kind of plugins and stuff use and in this one they've wrapped a few pieces of gulp specific functionality around it but it's pretty straightforward to use so first of all let's npm install uh, gulp dash sas and again we only want this for dev do, do, do. so that's gonna do that stuff on its merry way and the first thing that we're going to do is we are going to try. I say try because obviously I already know what's going to happen. But we're going to try this. So this task is now going to, going to be called SAS. It doesn't have to be. That's just a name. But it makes sense to call it something helpful. And the general way that gulp pipelines work is you often start from a source. And this is really a, a file chooser. So you point it at a particular file. And in this case, the directories are relative to gulp file. So gulp file is in scripts. So that is in the SAS folder and it's ink-flex.scss. So that's fine. And then we pipe the results of that to SAS. And then we pipe the results of SAS to a destination. Now I've just chosen a folder called dist, so that would be quite common in a library to have to have a destination of that. Eventually, I'll make it go to the CSS folder down here, but I just again step at a time, make sure it's working before um, before it fails. What does it not like? Oh, does it want me to put one of those on the end? Fair enough. Okay, so that should be enough. That's kind of the the basics of it. And if that's finished now, so if I now run gulp sass, bang, should show me an error. Now, this is not something that you should see, but it will depend on the framework that you're downloading. I wanted to keep this in here because I want you to kind of see some of the things that can happen when you kind of expect it to work out of the box and it doesn't. So let's just read what's happening here. So this is saying that on line one of this file here, this command at import compass support is not working. And the error is the file to import was not found or, or was unreadable compass slash support. Now I'm kind of thinking when I first looked at this, what's going on here? So where was it? Contrib compass, uh, what was it? Contrib compass CSS3 shared. So I went into here and looked at shared and it says import compass slash support. Now in this folder, there isn't a subfolder called compass. Compass is actually a level above. So this is trying to include compass support. Now it's a bit naughty because this has been written for the compass module. So this would work if that was the top level, but it doesn't work when it's not the top level. And that is really a bit naughty of of, um, of compass to do that and it's naughty of ink to just include it in that way what it means is we have to specify an include directory 
So if we in specify and include directory, we kind of say, well, when you're looking for files, as well as the current directory, look in this directory as well. And what we have to do to do that is we have to add some options into SAS. Again, this is just kind of JavaScript stuff. So we, ha <clears throat> we have an anonymous object we pass in with curly brackets. And in this case, we have a property called include paths. And this is the SAS, where are we again? SAS contrib. So when you're looking for stuff, look in the contrib. So then when you find compass slash shared, compass, so whatever it will support, then you'll find it in there. So it's as simple as that. If you search for gulp SAS and find the page on the internet, you'll find the various things that you can do here. But let's start with that and run it again. So we've now got a another error, as you can see. Now, what's it saying here? It's saying you've called the function darken with a color, which should be or must be a color, but it isn't. Well, why would that have happened? So I then looked and I basically found that line in uh, buttons.sass. Border, blah, 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 blah. So it's calling darken and then it's calling the function shade for a color to then translate that into a color, which is going to pass to darken. Now, long story short, the shade function exists in compass, doesn't exist in SAS by default, which is very naughty again, because they shouldn't really be using things. Certainly ink shouldn't be using this if this has a dependency, which you end up having to inject from outside. So the way I worked around this, and this is really not a very nice way of working around it, but it was certainly the easiest way to do it for now, is I added a helpers file and I happened to find on Tinterweb some examples of a tint and a shade color. And these use the mix function, which is available in SAS by default. So I've added helpers. And then to make that work, I'm actually compiling this file. So all I then did was added at import and then just added helpers. Duke. Save. So that's now going to bring in helpers as the very first thing. So then if anything sees shade or tint, then it will know now know what they are. So let's run this again. Just make sure. OK, it's certainly done something. Looks looks all right. Let's go and have a look. So because I used a dist folder, it's created that for me. And if I open up Inkflex, you'll see here I've got a nice big massive long CSS file. And the important thing just to kind of remind you guys about is that this is pure CSS that the browser is going to understand. So things like, say, you know, compact or whatever, although that's I'm not sure if actually if that's valid, that might be another one I need to add to my helpers. But anyway, um, all this is what the browser can understand. So all of the kind of functions and mix-ins and crazy stuff that um, that have been it, that were in the SCSS files have now been stripped out and put back to here. But I do think there are a couple I'll need to look at that. I think compact is a function that I also need to recreate. Don't worry, I've already tested it and it works anyway, so it doesn't matter too much for now. So I now have a CSS file, which is pretty cool. So one of the things I now want to do is actually test that it's working. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna delete that file there. Actually, I don't need to delete it, or delete it for me. And instead of putting it in dist, I'm gonna put it in dot dot slash um web slash css i think that's right so let's just run this again and make sure it pops back up in here which it did cool now if i go back to this site and i f5 it now all the colors have changed so obviously these are just the default colors that come with ink i haven't changed anything as you can probably tell so it's obviously different than what I had before, but that's fine because I want this system set up and working so I can actually move forwards and keep the changes I make in source control. So this is great so far. So what can I actually do with this now? Well, one of the kind of most simple things that I can do while I'm testing is if I go to config, 
this is where most of the stuff is that you'll actually want to change to to style it all up they do have themes for things but i'm not even sure what that is but let's just go into something simple let's open up the colors one and if you look here we've got say a text color we can guess what that means and if we actually did a, a search for that in uh, there we'll find that it's used in a, in a number of different places as a color for other things you can see the nav menus use it you can see forms use it images are using it so that's the cool thing about variables we'll have a little look in a minute of some of the features that you get in sas but if you can see by default it's a kind of a gray color 555 which you can see here that's this text you can see it's kind of gray so let's see what happens if i kind of change let's just change it to red because that will be really obvious then save that going to run sas again it's going to dump this straight into the web folder and if press f5 text unsurprisingly has gone red and this is the kind of example of you can see here all of the different things that have changed that you might not have expected to change so changing it to red might be a helpful way of kind of dashing through all the pages and kind of saying oh have we have we screwed up something that we that we didn't mean to change so that's kind of the the nuts and bolts that's the basic compilation of it so let's go put that back to oh, 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 oh control save and run it again so that's all very fun at the minute it's still a little bit manual so we can do something else which is pretty cool we can use something called watch and what watch does is it says i'm going to look into a certain file path or file paths and if any of those files change i'm going to run the task that you tell me to run but i'm not going to exit i'm just going to sit here running in the background and i'm going to update every single time so let's show you how that works so we've gone back to 555 i think we ran it did we yep and we're back here so what we need to do is we need to go back and edit our gulp file again uh, we can leave that open and we're going to add another task to gulp and one of the cool things about gulp and grunt is you can have multiple tasks you can chain them together you could say i'm going to have a, a gulp task called default and it does one task followed by another task followed by another task so that's quite common for frameworks they might build css and then javascript and something else so we're going to add another task called well i'm going to call this default let's just change that to watch so in this case there's a couple of things that i want to kind of note it's complaining about my semicolons again so in terms of what are we watching so you would think we would watch this right but that's not actually correct here what happens in this case is i want to watch everything under this directory because just watching that i'm never going to change that file i might change colors i might change these ones but i'm not changing that so this actually needs to look at everything under sas that has a scss extension to it and these use something called globbing patterns so you can read about it on uh, in gulp in the, the gulp documents but effectively here we're saying under the sas directory every subdirectory thereof and subdirectories of subdirectories etc every single file you find that has an scss extension i want you to watch all of those obviously that could be star dot star it might only be one directory you don't have to look everywhere but in this case because most of the time they're all spread out in different places we could watch that and then and then we say well what do we want to run if those files change we want to run the sas task which is that one we've got up there we could run more than one task but in this case that's why it's in array but in this case we just want to run one and we could actually add other watches as well so we could watch something else and run a different task so we could have something you know like this if we want to we might have a i don't know a javascript watcher or something and we might run you know whoop might run uglify or something like that so you can have more than one but in our case let's not go crazy let's just keep this like this so now i'm not going to run gulp sas from the command line i'm going to run gulp watch so here run gulp watch 
And notice what happens is it will tell you that the task has run and finished. Now it hasn't actually finished, you'll notice, because it hasn't dropped back to the command prompt. So now this window will just sit there forever. And let's go back here and press F5 just to prove what's going to happen here. So that's all grey. But now if I go in here and change this back to red again, and obviously I could change anything else. And then if I F5, so that gulp task is just automatically seen that I've changed this. It's run the build, you know, it's gone pretty quickly and it's it's done all that. So I can very, very quickly make a change and immediately see what's going on. Now there is something else you can use browser link, which works really well if you're using Node.js. So with browser link, you can actually get it to run a browser for you. And as well as changing this, it can then automatically reload the page here without you having to press F5. So there's some cool stuff you can do. You, do the, you can wire it up to the JavaScript and everything else as well. But for what I'm doing, that's probably a little bit much for now. And I think the last thing that I want to show you is, um, well, actually the last thing I want to show you in terms of code is how we minify the file. And that's because, as hopefully you know, I mean, this file here, let's, uh, where am I, back in here. Uh, this file, I don't know if I can get the properties of it. So how big is that? Does it... Uh, doesn't even say. Hang on a sec. I will look in Windows Explorer. So that CSS file as it is, is 223 kilobytes. That's pretty damn big and not really something that, you know, that we want to deploy at that size. Obviously, we could cut out loads of this stuff. So if we knew we were only using a little bit of the functionality, we could open up Inkflex and say, actually, I'm not using the grid. Let's comment that out. Not using navigation. Let's comment that out. If you were doing that and you should, then obviously that would be smaller. But at the minute, 223 is pretty big. So what we can do here, as well as the include paths, we can also add the um, output style. And there are a number of things that you can do here. But for now, I'm just going to say compressed need to save that I probably need to control C that and then let's just run SAS again um, and now that's gone down by 50k roughly and it's gone down by 50k if I reload this because if I go into CSS You'll see here what's actually happened is this whole file has been minified. So it becomes harder to read, but for production, it becomes significantly smaller. So that's pretty cool as well. There are other options. You can do stuff. I mean, you can remove um, comments and stuff if you want. You can you can do a number of different things. You can also set, I think, how, how compressed it goes. I think sometimes it will leave new lines in there just to make it a bit easier to read. But this is kind of compress it as much as possible, remove all white space. So that's pretty cool. So we kind of covered the, the basics of using gulp here. We've covered using watch. So while we're developing, we can get the things kind of working. And the main thing that's, I guess, important is we're pushing this directly into the CSS folder so that once we're actually finished developing and we might go back into my exit, our gulp file, we then know that the file that's in there can get committed to source control and or deployed to production and it's going to work because it's what we've been using locally. So that's all really nice. Also really important that we're keeping our um, our scripts and stuff all source controlled in here because then we know if somebody does change something and a button stops working or whatever or looks funny, then we can go back and say, ah, they were trying to change the, the nav bar and they that broke the button and kind of go around and fix it so that's that uh one more thing just a quick note about what happens if the library updates now you can't really in this instance the way these are laid out you can rarely update the library without it kind of changing stuff however because of the way these things are usually configured unless the ink framework majorly change say these colors 
then you know you might find that actually this file is exactly the same in the new library in the new version and then you can just merge their updates into these other files but the only thing you can really do is download the new library do a diff between them see if it looks like something that you want and if not just keep with the version that you've already got if you can take the changes in they might just be little one line fixes great copy them over but again you've got it all in source control so that's really cool and so i just want to finish the video quickly with a very quick run through of some of the sorts of things that you can do in SAS, one of the things that makes it really cool. The first really obvious one we've seen is the idea of a variable. So you have a variable with a dollar sign, we give it a value, and then everywhere we use that color, that's where the SAS compiler will replace this with hash 333. But the main thing is we can reuse that color in lots of places. And if we change that value in one place, all of them will be affected without having to try and do a find and replace. When that's matched up with a function like, you know, one of these where we say darken this by 10%, then it still works because if I change that number, then it will be the different number that gets darkened, not the original number. So we that fixes one of our find and replace types of problems. So that's pretty cool. Nesting is another thing that just makes things really easy to read. So we can write write it like this in SAS. We can write it like a nested set of brackets, nested objects. And SAS will turn this into this. Because in CSS, having NavUL, the NavLi, Nav this, Nav that, you can end up with lots and lots of things that are not easy to group together. They can easily become separated. And somebody overrides one of them in the wrong place or whatever, and it gets very confusing. But here we can say everything related to the nav is under these brackets. If you need to change it, it gets changed here. And then let SAS generate those for CSS. We already looked at partials. Partials have an underscore at the start. And again, that means that if you point, uh, we could point SAS here. We could point the compiler at everything under here. But we would need to delete four of these first because we only actually want it to compile that one like i say this has got like five root files depending on which one you want if it only had ink flex in there all of the others you'll find are underscores which means you could point sass at the whole lot it would ignore all of the underscores and only compile that one so that's what partials are it's pretty clever with the import you don't have to have the extension on the end it finds it you don't have to have the underscore on it it finds it so all of these four i think work so that's what partials are and it just allows you to pretty much separate things into individual files make it a bit easier somebody can work on the grids very easily by themselves just check in that partial everyone else can do a, a fetch and a, a fast forward and then they're all up to date which is nice then mix-ins are basically shortcuts they're kind of saying well, if you're going to have to do all particularly browser extensions to do certain things, that can get quite tedious because everywhere you might want to transform something, you've got to add those three lines yourself. Well, a mix in is kind of saying if you use that word transform. So here we're saying for box, I want you to transform by a rotation of 30 degrees and the mix in will say, oh, OK. I will get your box and then I'll get all of those three and I'll add the property that you gave me, which was that one to the value to, of all of them so that's pretty cool that saves some time and because you can pass in more than one property you can kind of do some cleverer stuff as well but it just means that look at that one a one-liner and you've got all of that and obviously you could use it on more than one element as well we then have the concept of extending or in inheritance if you like so you have a a base set of information and that's marked by the little percent sign and then you can inherit those. So in this example, we're saying, well, equal heights isn't impl isn't extended anywhere. So the CSS in here w won't go through to the, the final CSS because the compiler will just forget about it. But in the case, say message shared, we say, well, dot message extends message shared, but dot su success also extends message shared and then adds a border color of green. So nice little way of ex extending stuff, especially things like buttons and things where you, you often have a base button and specialized buttons. And then the CSS would say, well, they both extend message shared. So dot message and dot success will both get this stuff. 
but dot success also adds a border color green so i'm going to add a separate class for dot success with border color green so just again kind of making stuff maybe you know trying to remove the repetition and the duplication that we often have there are millions of functions that are color functions like rgb and hsl and all darken and lighten and tint and whatever there are logical functions so things like you know if mixing exists blah name then do something so a whole load of logical functions a load of mathematical ones as well so you can do all kinds of stuff in terms of functionality that just again you can do it in css but you normally have to do it manually so there's a load load of those about 50 60 different functions and then operators like you know that divided by that times that so if you notice here the the thing that makes this clever is they're both in pixels but yet it will let you divide them so it's clever enough to go 600 pixels divided by 960 pixels times 100 percent is 62 and a half percent so that's pretty cool you can do stuff like that again loads of different operators and things so that kind of brings us neatly really to the end of what I wanted to cover so we've seen SAS, we've seen some of the reasons why we might want to use it and why CSS is a pain. And then we've used Gulp inside a, a node project, a node package within a PHP web application. So this is almost like a little child application. We've used Gulp, which we've installed as a node module. And Gulp has been running some functionality for us. In this case, it's taken in a single SAS file, which is pretty much a load of includes built that all into a single css file and it's writing it to the output and then we've also seen how we can use gulp watch in order to actually let that thing run in real time and update as we make changes so hopefully that was useful hopefully it wasn't too fast hopefully it wasn't too slow any questions or comments uh, please don't ask me about sas because i really don't know very much about it but any questions or comments just put them on the comments below and i'll see you in